Welcome to The Real News, I'm Jess Lenore. The COVID-19 outbreak has upended life as we know it. And one of the places it's having the greatest impact that's received less attention than it deserves is public education. Teaching that was once done in a classroom has been moved online. And while this transition poses challenges for all students and educators, the impact is most extreme in school districts where public policy has created wealth and opportunity gaps across racial and class lines. Well, now joining us to discuss this are two guests who've been studying this closely. Kalila Harris is the Managing Director for K-12 Education Policy at the Center for American Progress, and Rebecca Jacobson is Associate Professor at Michigan State University. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So Kalila, we'll start with you. You live here in Baltimore, um, and um, we know that that's one of the districts with you know, some of the most extreme inequality a recent study found that 40% of Baltimore public school students lack devices to access the internet or broadband access. Um, what kind of impact is that going to have on education? You know, a lot of wealthier families and households, that's not, you know, lacking broadband access and lacking internet devices is not something that they have to worry about or have to think about. There are a number of critical issues that uh, those statistics tell us. One, um, of the 60% of students who have access to devices is the quality of instruction such that they will continue learning and not experience deeper gaps in opportunity. For the students who don't have devices or having to share devices in a household with a number of siblings or a parent who's trying to work, um, you really have a situation where we will see um, impact for a decade or more um, because you have a, a, a set of young people who, even if they were motivated to learn, even if they were excited about schooling, now are having to figure out how to even access schools. The other piece of that is with that 40% of students, and depending on the data we have for those families, some of those students may be in crisis, some of those students may uh, be English language learners, some of those students may be students with disabilities, and the question begets why um, are they not having access to their services? When will they get access to their services? And in what ways can the school district ramp up to make sure every child who's on their roll is accounted for? Because there's also the issue of increased domestic violence, increased reports of suicide, increased reports of child abuse at this time. And let me take a step back, actually decrease in reports of child abuse, which is extremely troubling. Mm. It means that young people are experiencing things behind closed doors due to um, stay at home orders that no one can see. And oftentimes the school would be the reporter if they saw abuse. So 40% is unacceptable. It's a huge number. Um, up, it, so there are two issues there. One is the 40% who don't have access to the devices or broadband. The other issue is of the 60%, how many of those students have actually connected with the school system? And that's true across the country as well. There are a number of superintendents and state chiefs who are reporting districts where 40, 50% of the students have not been uh, in contact with the district. And that is troubling. You could have a student who's really interested in school, but their parents lost their job. Um, they've had to pick up and move suddenly. And that is really going to be a crisis that we're dealing with long beyond finding a vaccination or developing a herd immunity. And Rebecca, I wanted to ask you to weigh in on that question. Um, what, what concerns you most about this situation? I couldn't agree more with what Kalila has already shared. I think that I share those same exact concerns. So I just want to add on to what she said. I think one of the issues that we also have to consider is the level of stress that kids are experiencing. And we certainly know that when you are stressed, it is much harder to process information. It's much harder to learn. It's harder to take in new information. So even for the best case scenario where students are highly motivated and have access, uh, we have an added level of stress, especially in disinvested communities where parents' jobs are now unstable, parents' jobs are unpredictable, and there can be no doubt that there's higher levels of stress in the household that the children are experiencing. I'd also say we need to think about the quality of instruction. So even if kids are able to get online and able to log in and participate, I don't think that what we currently have comes anywhere near to replacing the kinds of learning interactions that take place in real time, where students do something, they get immediate feedback and can make those corrections. 
Teachers have a relationship with kids. They know how to motivate them. All of those things are lost in this online virtual format. And Kalila, um, I wanted to ask you about Baltimore specifically. Um, so what, have, what have you heard? You know, I know you're involved with the, the um, groups that are advocating on behalf of, of students and parents and, and teachers here. Um, you know, there's, I know I've heard good story. I've heard some good and bad, but talk about what you've heard and what, what's, what sense you have on, on how things are going right now in Baltimore. It's really tough. You know, um, I've been in contact with uh, the leaders of the Parent and Community Advisory Board. They're trying their hardest to make sure they have um, up-to-date information from both the school board and the CEO. Dr. Santelises has been um, extremely engaging and in close contact and updating them um, regularly and, and, and even more than regularly, so that's great to hear. The challenge is if there are Students without access to broadband and technology at a rate of 40%, you also have that number of families who may not be hearing anything from the school district or not sure how to support their students. Mm. Also want to think about um, not only the stress of the children, but the stress of the educators. And so the idea of not only many, if not most of them, not being trained to deliver a distance learning model, um, that they are now thrust in front of a camera, allowing access into their homes in a way that they may have wanted to protect before as much as they love their children. Um, and asking those people to bridge divides um, that were not created by them, that were instead created by systemic inequity. Uh, so we are, uh, have heard from Dr. Santelises to say that um, uh, there was a high percentage of students, somewhere around 80%, who started coursework um, when distance learning began, um, and that, that slowly but surely began to uh, fade away. So you have teachers with one student, three students, five students reporting here in Baltimore. And I hear the same things around the country, so this is not unique to Baltimore City, um, but it, it is a stressful situation. You do have teachers that I talk to who are extremely concerned, again, about abuse and students who they knew were in volatile um, living situations. We have a high number of students in Baltimore City who are either experiencing homelessness or uh, living in foster care. And so the question becomes, what kind of supports are, for, are those children having? And then you have students who were um, in a juvenile justice situation or in a juvenile detention situation who were due to come back to school or back home. And there's a break in a linkage between um, their return to home or their return to school. And I must say also the same is true for young people who might have been suspended um, from school long term or even short term, what was put in place to bridge their supports that they would have gotten if school were back in session. It might have been um, a, a 30 day plan to get them back on track and um, moving along with their classmates. Did any of that happen? Right. And those are some of the things that go unseen because it's not in an IEP or it's not in a support plan for an English language learner. Um, so we definitely are seeing parents and families rallying around their children, I must say. The other day I was able to view a concert from Orchids and those amazing young people learning to play instruments um, were able to display their talents and what would have been normally their presentations um, at this point in the school year. I was able to participate in Lily Mae Carol Jackson's eighth grade presentations of learning, which is a rite of passage for students in an expeditionary learning school model. So I've been interacting with educators from across the city who are trying to maintain the semblance of uh, normalcy and rigor and quality for their students. The challenge is when you live in communities that have been disinvested uh, for so long, you have teachers who are in many ways bearing the brunt of um, closing gaps and opportunity for young people um, all over the city instead of just in their classrooms. And Rebecca, um, I wanted to build off that, but also ask you, you know, during the Great Recession, um, our previous economic hardships that we, you know, faced um, a decade ago, uh, many states cut education funding. And part of that is because, you know, we fund schools in this country based on property taxes, which creates systemic inequities in what, what wealthier districts get than, you know, than districts that have less wealth. Can you build off what Khalil is saying, but also talk about 
Um, if you're concerned, I mean, I think there's already, there's already mm-hmm. talk about school budgets being cut now in the wake of this. Um, you know, what, what impact could that have, especially for districts that already are under-resourced? Yeah, and, and the, the reference to the, the previous crisis in 2007, 2008 is really important because when we look back at the cuts that took place, even after our economy rebounded and there was more money, we never caught up. Those districts that had been disinvested um, actually never caught up, and they ended up even further behind. And I think that this is going to be an even more severe uh, example of that happening, where we make big cuts, and it is those communities with the least amount of investment, the least internal resources to draw upon, who then cannot simply make up the difference, whereas those communities that have the resources either make up those uh, differences publicly through increased taxes or privately with parents making donations to their personal schools, parents making donations to the classrooms that their students are in. Uh, so there's many more opportunities to make up those differences. And when we see the public cuts, it's really those least able to make up the difference who suffer the most. And so I think we're going to end up even further behind and exacerbate the inequality that we already have. Um, I also wanted to mention, I'm really glad that Kalila has said several times now, the importance of the number of kids that are just simply no longer being seen. Um, And I think that is a real concern that has not received nearly enough attention. Uh, As a a foster parent and now an adoptive parent from the foster care system, I know extremely intimately what it's like to work with children that have experienced abuse. And I think when kids go back into the school system, not only will teachers be facing those gaps from learning, but they're going to have a lot more um, students that have experienced high levels of trauma, and we are not providing our teachers, we're not equipping them with the resources, the support, and the training that they need to work with traumatized children. And until we work with their emotional well-being, we'll never be able to continue to push forward and meet their ability in an academic setting. And Kalila, um, I wanted to get you to weigh in on that, but... I know that, you know, when, when you were at The Real News, we worked together on covering the Kerwin Commission, which was this historic education plan to, you know, revamp public, public schools across the state of Maryland, which has, you know, a huge deficit in terms of what, um, this, you know, what resources wealthier. We have some of the wealthiest districts in the entire country, but we also have, you know, areas that have been greatly disinvested, like Baltimore. Um, and so, essentially, our governor, Larry Hogan, who has opposed this, um, you know, since its inception, as we as we all know, he vetoed it, basically saying that we can't raise taxes, you know, during this pandemic. And that, that was the reason he gave. Um, I wanted to get your response to that. First of all, uh, I want to reiterate that 50 percent of the states who cut education funding never returned up until last year to pre-recession funding. And Maryland was one of those states. Okay, so, it, you know, it's not just a couple of states or a few states. Half of the states never returned to pre-recession funding from the 2007-2008 uh, recession period. Larry Hogan said before the legislative session ended that he would veto the Kerwin bill, that he was not for it. Larry Hogan had uh, $20,000 plate fundraisers uh, to get money to build a campaign against the Kerwin Commission um, as the numbers started to roll out for what it would cost to provide quality education per Maryland's constitution uh, for Maryland's children. So at the end of the legislative session, which was truncated because of the pandemic, uh, the Kerwin bill passed through the legislature. There was an amendment added in there that said if state receipts fell below 7.5%, which they absolutely will, it's being projected that Maryland's receipts will be uh, 15 to 20% lower. Um, and that's tax receipts collection of revenues to support uh, the government. There was no reason for him to veto the legislation um, with that amendment in place. So sometimes he will do smoke and mirrors where um, he'll say, I support education, I'm the education governor, but there's no real evidence of it. Um, He talked about the lockbox um, for the casino money as if he put forward the lockbox and that was actually Democratic members in the legislature. And then he campaigned for governor on being the education governor through this lockbox just because he simply allowed the bill to pass. So, you know, it's really unfortunate. This was, um, had the potential to be 
an astronomical improvement on the quality of education for all of Maryland students. The state legislature now has uh, the question in front of them on whether or not uh, they call a special meeting so that we can do a couple of things, overturn his veto of the current legislation, overturn his veto of the HBCU legislation to settle that case, overturn um, his legislation related to uh, uh, women having access to post-incarceration facilities. There are so many things that he regressively vetoed and said that it was because of his unwillingness to raise taxes. Um, but again, throughout that period, um, he uh, was saying he would do that. I'm also a senior fellow with the Maryland Center on um, Economics and Budget. And, you know, we talk a lot about all of the ways he could have supported closing corporate loopholes in, in the tax code, as well as focusing on the 1%. The 1% still is able to pay more taxes because they're not being impacted in the way the rest of us are. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, I think he's played this role of a moderate Republican, and he's in no way moderate when it comes to the policies that he tends to pass. And it's really going to be up to our legislature to stand up and say, we will not allow the current commission legislation to die based on a veto, that we need to override that and make sure that we are putting our money where our mouth is for our children. And in fact, now is the time to really double down on equity. When we're in a situation like this where so many communities are continuing to be impacted and, and gaps in opportunity are growing, now is not the time to pull away from equity. And equity has to be at the center and the front end, not an add-on, which is how we find ourselves here to begin with. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, you know, we're still early in this whole, you know, in this pandemic, and we didn't even know what the full impacts are. And, you know, as you both raised the issue of the students that no one has heard from for months. So, um, you know, it's something we're going to definitely keep following up on and, um, you know, and also talk about what solutions look like and what we can all do to help uh, make public education a more just institution in this country. Uh, Cleola Harris, Managing Director at K-12 Education Policy at CAP, Center for American Progress, and Rebecca Jacobson, Associate Professor at Michigan State University. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.